Good afternoon. My name is Philip Lucas from the Business and Client Services team here at Inform Solutions and I'm delighted to welcome you all and my colleague Tom Weeks to this webinar as part of the Digital Leaders Cyber Resilience Week. Just before I hand over to Tom, uh, I'd like to offer a couple of comments. Firstly, you're here for the session with Tom, so I will hand over in just a moment. We have no intention of wasting time setting out credentials in great detail. Tom will say a brief word about informed solutions, but we respect the fact that you're not here to listen to a sales pitch. Uh, secondly, I'd just like to set out that you will not be receiving unsolicited emails and phone calls from us following the session today. If you'd like to get in touch at any stage, we'll respond and be happy to have a conversation, but that's only if you initiate it. Thirdly, please feel free to submit any questions during the session via the chat function, please, or subsequently by email. And that, in very short order, is the preamble dealt with. I'll now hand over to Tom to take you through this afternoon's presentation. Thanks, Philip, and thanks to everyone for making some time on a, on a Friday to join the webinar. Just as a very brief introduction to myself, my name is Tom Weeks. I'm a technical director with Informed Solutions. I'll say a very bit, a, a very small bit about Informed Solutions in a second, but in a, essentially we are a digital transformation practice working across the public and private sectors. And through our work in digital transformation, we come into contact with a lot of cyber resilience transformation requirements and we wanted to share some of our experiences with you. Just on the logistics of the presentation, I've got a short set of slides that I'd like to take everybody through today. Should take about 20 minutes. Once we get through the slides, um, we'll take a short break of about a minute or two just to give people a chance to write some questions using the chat facility on GoToMeeting. If we have some questions at the end of the presentation, then fantastic. I will do my best to answer those. But if we don't, we will draw the webinar to a close there. So let's get, into, let's get stuck into this then. So the main, the main premise of the presentation that I wanted to talk to you about is that digital transformation and cyber resilience are two strategic themes for organisations that go hand in hand. And I wanted to basically explain why we have that viewpoint based on our experience consulting to different organisations. And then once we've walked you through our thoughts on, on why that is, actually take you through a worked example of how, as part of the digital transformation, we address cyber resilience requirements. So I think that really this presentation, all, all being well, it will be interesting to everyone who's on the webinar, but I think it's particularly relevant to those people who are either planning a digital transformation or in the midst of a transformation and want to understand what role cyber resilience should play in that. So a very brief bit of, bit of background to inform solutions. This is the only, the only slide that I have about us. Um, by way of background, we were formed in 1992. We're a medium-sized organisation of 60 consultants with offices in, in Altrincham, in Manchester, London, Edinburgh, Sydney and Melbourne. We do an awful lot of work across both the public and private sectors. So examples of our clients include Foreign Commonwealth Office, the Home Office, the Cabinet Office, in the public sector, and then a number of organisations in private sector, such as Merce Goyle, BHP Billiton, and Sellafield. Um, so we, we've experienced digital transformation and we've experienced cyber resilience as part of transformation in a range of industries in, and, and sectors. And we have seen some common themes of, uh, along the way that it's worth, worth describing to you today and sharing with you. So just for the purposes of this presentation, just to get going, um, I thought I would give you a couple of definitions that, that really are, you know, set some context for the, for the conversation. And when I talk about digital transformation and cyber resilience, you know, we may, we may have slightly different viewpoints about what the definitions are, but, but this is the, the perspective that the presentation is built around. So when I talk about digital transformation, what I'm really talking about is some kind of profound change or transformation of an organisation from a perspective of its products, its services that it provides and its people and its processes and that profound change is underpinned by opportunities presented by, by new technology. When we talk about cyber resilience, this is a relatively new perspective in the security and resilience um, industry and really cyber resilience brings together this idea that um, 
you know, cyber security and, and cyber threats are something that we've all got to live with. And although you can do your very best to prevent cyber events from happening, and a cyber event might be a cyber attack, um, you know, at some point you are inevitably going to be, um, be, be harmed by that attack. Something's going to get through your defences. And when something does get through your defences, how well can you continue to work under business as usual? How resilient are you? So building on from there, it's probably worth saying a bit about how digital transformation actually changes an organisation and then based on those changes, what does that mean for cyber resilience? So digital transformation is pretty, it's characterised by some or all of the things shown on this slide here. Um, and again, it really, it really involves quite a profound change across a number of different parts of the organisation or, you know, across people, process and technology. And often it changes not just um, how the organisation goes about its business, but also what that business is. Um, so just picking out a selection of the things on this slide, I mean, you, you'll all be able to see and, and read those for yourself, but some of these are worth picking out more than others. New and changed products and services is a very popular reason behind people's digital transformation. Often people see that new technologies present the opportunity to provide new services and they want to take advantage of that opportunity. And whenever you provide a new service or a new product, inherently that product or service might introduce opportunities to deal with cyber resilience better or it may introduce new threats that you need to think about. Use of cloud services is also an interesting theme as part of digital transformation. Historically, people are very used to having a lot of control over their IT estate because that IT estate is located in their premises. With the cloud, as we all know, what we're doing is taking advantage of, of computing power that's somewhere elsewhere in the world. That introduces lots of interesting um, problems with respect to data sovereignty, you know, who owns the data, but also how confident and assured you can be that that data is going to be protected from cyber events. The change around agile ways of working is an interesting one. Often people use digital transformation as a vehicle for not only changing what services and products they provide, but also how they build those, those products and services internally. And a common theme is that people, people want to be able to deliver new services or change their services more frequently and more often. So feasibly, when you're working in an agile way, you can often be introducing new risks, new cyber risks, more rapidly into your business. And if you don't have the governance to deal with that change and that way of working, then you potentially open yourself up to more and new types of risk. So that's all I will say on that. So building out from there then, if that's how digital transformation impacts an organisation and changes an organisation, what opportunities does that change present for cyber resilience? And I think from our experience, the number one opportunity is that, that digital transformation presents is that it gives you the chance to take a much more strategic approach to how you deal with cyber resilience than if you were just doing cyber resilience and outside of a transformation. What we've noticed is that when people are looking at cyber resilience and it isn't part of the programme of transformation, it tends to be introducing um, ways of dealing with cyber security in a very piecemeal way. So you might add a piece to one process or a piece to one technology that, that improves your ability to deal with cyber threats, but actually end to end as a business you're still quite vulnerable. And more importantly, the way that cyber resilience is dealt with isn't particularly elegant. You know, you can end up making what were quite smooth processes a little bit clunky when you just bolt little bits on here or there. And what digital transformation offers is the opportunity to, to really engineer in cyber resilience end-to-end -end into your processes and technology, and also your people's roles and responsibilities. The second point there and the second opportunity that transformation presents for cyber resilience is that cyber resilience, is, although we all probably agree it's an incredibly important topic, it's not a topic that will win hearts and minds in its own right and it can be difficult to generate energy behind the organisation to take the topic seriously. Often people still think that it, cyber, cyber security attacks are something that happens to someone else 
And actually, we, as we all know, cyber, cyber security is something that can affect anybody at any time. We've seen a lot of events in the news recently whereby you've got, you've got ransomware events like the, the WannaCry virus that are impacting more and more organisations. So it's fair to assume that at some point your organisation might be a target and you don't want to be complacent about how critical cyber security is. So when you are going through a transformation and you're generating a lot of, um, a lot of, pl a lot of energy in your organisation to excite people about the change, that's an ideal, an ideal opportunity to make people aware of cyber resilience and actually what their roles and responsibilities are in managing cyber resilience. Related to that is the third point, that while you're going through a transformation, that is also an opportunity for you to make a good business case for investing in cyber resilience. So people, although people acknowledge that cyber resilience is important, by itself it isn't always something that people can build a, a, a super strong business case around. People might award a little bit of funding for you to do something to protect the organisation but they wouldn't as w award as much funding as they would if they were going about a, a, a significant transformation of their organisation. So if you can build cyber resilience capabilities into your business case of transformation, then ultimately you can end up with a much stronger capability for dealing with cyber threats than you would if you were just trying to do res manage resilience outside of the transformation. And finally, that last point there about um, is, is more of a technical point about if you're delivering your transformation in an agile way, then the agile delivery method that people tend to follow actually presents a really great opportunity to force people to think about cyber resilience quite carefully as part of their day-to-day -day roles. So if, if anybody's familiar with agile working and a way of working called Scrum, they'll be aware that Scrum has the concept of a definition of done, which is where if somebody is delivering a change into the business, before that change goes live, people have to evidence that it's satisfying the business requirements and business need that it was supposed to. And that evidence is supplied by showing that they have complied with what's called a definition of done. And if you can build cyber resilience and cyber security controls into your definition of done, then you're taking very good and strong steps to making sure that you're, you're governing cyber resilience carefully and, and strongly as part of your transformation. So those are the opportunities as we see them and have seen them with our clients. There are also a number of imperatives around cyber resilience when you're going about transformation. There are a number of reasons why it's incredibly important to think about, think about cyber resilience. As I mentioned earlier, cyber resilience is rarely an organisation's core reason why they want to go about changing themselves. Often the main reason an organisation wants to transform itself is to take advantage of new products and services and the, the better customer engagement and the better revenue opportunities that that transformation offers. But if, if when you go through that transformation you're not thinking about cyber resilience, then you're opening yourself up to a number of, of, of risks. The first risk that we see is that you don't see how your overall organisational risk profile is changing if you're not paying attention to cyber resilience. When you're going through a digital transformation, often your focus will be on the projects that are part of your transformation and the risks that, that affect delivery of those projects. You're very rarely thinking, or people very rarely consciously think about, how does all this change impact the risks that my organisation as a whole is facing? So the organisation at the end of the transformation could be very, very different from the organisation at the start and it could be facing very different risks. If, for example, you're introducing a number of new products and services into your, into your portfolio, each one of those products and services might prevent new avenues for somebody to exploit, for example, um, new, new services that involve taking money in, in exchange for products. They possibly present an opportunity for fraud. And if you're not an organisation that's used to working in a digital way, then those can be quite new risks that you you may not explicitly recognise unless you're thinking about cyber resilience. The second imperative as we see it is that if you're, if you're not careful as you go about your transformation, your attack surface as an organisation can grow rather than shrink. And when we talk about attack surface, we really mean the, 
the sum of all the all the channels that somebody could exploit um, using cyber technology, um, all the things that they could use to impact your your business. Now, digital transformation done well might introduce a lot of a lot of new technology, but that technology should be ideally hardened to protect against cyber threats. But unless you're really conscious of of how your technology is changing your attack surface. There's a risk that you introduce lots of lots of new points of vulnerability and don't harden them enough, so you make it easy for the attacker to take advantage of you. Related to that is the third point on in the middle, which is around increasing your cost to defend against a cyber event rather than someone else's cost to attack. It's all be it's all very well to introduce lots of new technology um, and lots of business process change. But if you're not thinking about the risks that, that that change introduces and you're not consciously thinking about how you're going to protect those changes from cyber threats, then really you're, you're, you're going to introduce lots more cost into your operations as opposed to reducing those costs. The fourth point we've already mentioned, which is if you don't think about cyber resilience explicitly, you risk getting part way through your transformation or quite late on in your transformation and then you suddenly realise there's a job to do around cyber security and by then you've missed the opportunity to, to think about it in a strategic way and we return to this, this issue about potentially bolting on cyber resilience controls as opposed to building them in and all those processes and all those services and all those products that you were hoping to make nice and slick through your transformation actually end up being um, clunkier than you wanted and not, not as streamlined. And finally, the other imperative is that I'm sure a lot of people will be aware that there's major new um, legal and regulatory compliance requirements coming into the UK in the near future, an example of which would be the General Data Protection Regulation that comes into effect in, in May next year. And digital transformation is an ideal opportunity to manage and manage compliance with those regulations and build it into your systems um, right from the ground up as opposed to again bolting it on into separate systems and separate processes you can really make compliance a core part of everything you do rather than something that sits around the edges of, 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 of your operations and if you're bearing that in mind as you go through your transformation then you can comply with those sorts of regulations quite cost effectively and if anybody's actually had a look at, for example, the General Data Protection Regulation, you'll see that there's some actually very significant requirements that that imposes on you, and it's in everybody's interest to think about how they can be dealt with as efficiently as possible. So that, that's a kind of summary of what we mean by digital transformation and cyber resilience and some of the opportunities and imperatives that transformation presents to cyber resilience. Um, the sort of logical next question is, so if, if, if you're faced with a situation where you're trying to transform your organisation and you've also been charged with thinking about cyber resilience or it's a concern that's on your mind that you want to, that you want to build awareness of, of internally, where do you actually start in dealing with that? And cyber resilience is a very broad topic and it can be very difficult to know, know where to start because it's such a maze of, of standards and opinion and although it shouldn't be a topic that's just for technologists, inevitably it is a, it is a technical discipline that takes, takes some work to understand and get to the bottom of. So what we wanted to present here was our method for how we, as part of the transformation, get to grips with cyber resilience and help our clients through the journey of making themselves more resilient. And what we typically do is start with a framework called the Cyber Security Framework provided by the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, which is an American organisation. And the reason we choose that as our overarching framework for dealing with cyber resilience is just its, its simplicity, really. You can see by looking at the diagram on the right that it's made up of five stages uh, which form a life cycle. And essentially, it describes how an organisation can go about identifying the cyber threats that it faces and the cyber risks that it faces, what measures it can take to protect against and prevent those risks from materialising. Then, in the worst case, if those risks do materialise, how can they be detected? How do you respond to them and how do you recover from them? 
and that's a framework that you don't have to be a technologist to understand. You don't necessarily need 10 years experience in digital transformation or cyber resilience to get your head around that. And so this makes an ideal framework for having, if you're, if you're part of a transformation, having useful conversations with all the stakeholders who are part of that transformation as well and helping them to really understand what cyber resilience means and what it takes to deal with it. Another reason we like this framework is that it suits organisations of all sizes and missions, so it's equally applicable to public sector, it's equally applicable to private sector, it, it works for small organisations, it works for charities, it works for big blue chips, it's, it's a sensible framework regardless of, of what sort of business you're in, and critically as well, it's very systematic and standards based. So you can take you can take um, standard, other cyber security standards such as Cyber Essentials which is a, a standard developed by the Cabinet Office or ISO 27001 which is the International Standard for Information Security and you can take some of the controls from those standards and easily plug them into this framework as, you, as your understanding of cyber resilience develops. So what I wanted to do now was walk you through a worked example of how we would take that framework and use it to map out the cyber resilience risks that might affect an organisation as part of the transformation. And then once you've got a view of those risks, how do you then map out the controls that you're going to put in place to, to mitigate those risks? And then once you've done that, how do you simulate how effective those controls are likely to be in a, in a cyber resilience situation? So this next slide takes that framework and it maps out some of the typical risks that we see um, with respect to cyber resilience when we're, we're working with clients as part of digital transformation. Now this isn't supposed to be an exhaustive, li exhaustive list of risks, it's just supposed to be indicative but also give you an idea of how you could go about mapping out your cyber resilience risks at a strategic level so that when you're having conversations about transformation at a senior level you can have those conversations in an easily explainable way. And we find that frameworks and illustrations like this are a great way to build awareness with, with very senior stakeholders, often at a board level, because it really helps them to understand in a top-down way what are some of the risks and threats that they need to be aware of. And critically, it helps them to understand that cyber resilience isn't just a technical issue. I mean, actually, we've got the majority of the, the risks that we've highlighted there sit at a people and process level and although we could, we could certainly think of lots to sit at the technology level, actually it, this demonstrates that we should be paying as much if not more attention at the people and process tiers. So again I won't go blow by blow through the risks that I've listed here, I'll just pick out some which I think are, are of interest based on our experience. The first one I'll point out is the very top one under people, which is often that we see a, la you know, a lack of, of real board level understanding about what cyber resilience is. It's very often a case that the board will, will feel that cyber resilience is, is an IT concern, that as long as they've got basic infrastructure measures in place like firewalls and secure networks, then, then they're good to go. And although board level awareness is definitely improving, we still see we still see a lot of organisations and work with a lot of boards where they don't fully appreciate just how high up on their agenda cyber resilience should be. What we would the, the things that we typically see that need most attention is that boards often think and, and talk about in general terms about the cyber resilience risks they face and that's good that they have a risk awareness but often what they don't have a view on is just how defined is their appetite for accepting or mitigating those risks which then sets the tone for how the rest of all the organisation deals with them. Moving on from there, another, another useful risk to point out is under the process tier on the left hand side which is often organisations have a very siloed and insular view of what their risks are. Often their risks are, are based on people's own internal experience of how their organisation works it's not based on looking outwards towards the industry and taking advantage of some of the intelligence that's out there, for example, provided by the National Cyber Security Centre. Really to stay on, because it's such a fast moving area, people do need to look outwards to understand what are the kind of threats that they're facing and also the best and most efficient way to mitigate those threats. 
And the last thing I'll pick out there is under technology, the first, the first item on the left. Again, people talk often talk in very general terms about the attack surface and avenues of vulnerability that they have as an organisation. But if you asked a, a member of an IT team to walk you through in very specific terms what those, what those vulnerabilities were across the organisation, often you wouldn't be able to get a very crisp and concise answer because they, they're just not catalogued. So we, what we would typically recommend to people is, you know, as a minimum, you, you know, the real focus is understanding of what your risks are and then you can do something about them. And that sounds like a very obvious statement, but from what we've seen, that kind of outlook is only occurs in pockets in the organisation and it doesn't really appear end to end. So moving on from there, once you have a view of your risks, you can start to think about the controls that you want to put in place, again at a people and a process and a technology level to mitigate them. And once again, this isn't intended to be an exhaustive list of the controls that you should have in place or could have in place. The key point to say here is that once you have a view of your risks, that will really tell you where your biggest vulnerabilities are and clearly you want to, you want to direct your investment into the place where your, where your vulnerabilities are highest and where your investment will have the biggest impact. And so some of the controls that I've listed here, they give a flavour of where, from our experience, people can have the biggest impact on their organisation. Picking out some of the things that are worth talking about here in terms of how you can protect, protect yourself against cyber, cyber events. If you look under the process tier, um, the second item from the left at the top, a cyber resilience authority, often one of the, one of the constraints and risks that we see in the organisation is that there's, people think about cyber resilience in their own little areas, but they don't join up to think about the end-to-end -end, uh, end -end way that those risks impact the organisation and, and they don't have an end-to-end -end way to, to mitigate them. Having a cyber resilience authority which brings together people from operations, from technology, potentially from a board level and also from the business is a great, um, is a great vehicle for making sure that you're thinking holistically about how you deal with cyber resilience. So if you were going to do one thing from an operational level, our recommendation would be to bring together a group of people who as a, as a, as a forum have a have a mission to think about cyber resilience and manage that through in the event that issues occur. Some of the other things that are worth, worth picking out in here. The whole idea behind cyber resilience is that you can, do, you can do everything you want to identify and protect against cyber threats, but ultimately one, at some point something's going to get through your lines of defence and you're going to be in a position where you need to detect detect that issue, respond to it and recover from it. So a lot, a lot of the things that we see is people investing all their, all their time and money up front in the identi identify and protect stages for very sensible reasons in that people think prevention is better than cure, but you really do want to make sure that you balance your investment across the other later parts of the life cycle so that you're not caught cold when it comes to recovering from an event. And finally, once we've got our view of risks and we've got our view of controls, an exercise that we've found really useful in working with organisations just to understand how effective their capability is, is to think of a, think of a scenario, for example, a new, uh, a new severe ransomware threat like the WannaCry virus that cropped up a couple of months ago, and then going from left to right through the life cycle simulate how your different lines of defence would hold up and deal with that situation. And the critical thing to making this work and, and be a useful exercise is it's not just about saying, for example, OK, we've got industry engagement, so we'd have heard about, heard about this ransomware threat. It's actually drilling down into specifics. So what are the specific forums that you're engaging with that would have given you early visibility of this threat? Who are the people that are engaging with that, with that industry forum? How frequently? What might be the lead time between the threat emerging and us hearing about it? You've really got to be specific in order to, to make this exercise effective. 
and a lot of things that one of the things that we really learn through this exercise is that there might be individual capabilities um, that work well on their own so we might have for example the ability to monitor certain systems in our IT estate and, and learn if there are threats but actually those individual capabilities don't don't hook together well end to end across the organisation to provide an effective capability for detecting, responding and recovering from an event. So it's not just about how well do individual capabilities work, it's also about how effectively they hang together. And this is where you can really protect against that point I made earlier about cyber, cyber resilience being something that's bolted onto transformation as, a, as opposed to being built in. It should really be a very seamless um, flow through these capabilities in terms of how you deal with an event. Um, you want to think about you know, what would be the time scales for working through each capability, how long might it take up to go all the way from identifying something and detecting it to recovering from it. And then you can play that back to the, the people who have defined the organisation's risk appetite to see if that's an acceptable way of dealing with different threats. So, that is, that is all the slides that I had to present. appreciate that I've covered a lot of ground there, but i um, very happy to take a pause now. We will put ourselves on mute for a couple of minutes and give people some time to just reflect on what's been gone through and potentially ask some questions, and then we will unmute ourselves after a couple of minutes, and if there are questions, great, I'm happy to respond to those. Otherwise, we will end the webinar there. So I'll just pop myself on mute now and feel free to send a question through to us on the chat facility.